Okay, so it seems now it's recording. So welcome everybody, and thank you for coming to this new session of the Thimna Seminar course. Uh, today we're pleased to have with us uh, Juan Pedro Roldán Blasco, uh, who is a PhD student at IGE, Institute of Geoscience and Environmental Research in Grenoble, France. And today he's going to talk us about uh, computational glacier dynamics, uh, which I'm sure would be a very interesting topic uh, for mm -hmm. sure. So we are recording the seminar, so in case that somebody comes late, uh, you will find the seminar in the YouTube channel of Simne. Okay, so Juan Pedro, anyone can start. Okay, so thank you very much, Ignacy. So I'm gonna, well, as he said, I'm a PhD student in IGE, and IGE actually is a, an institute of research that is in Grenoble, so it's associated also with the University of Grenoble. And uh, well, it's here in France, and also is part of the CNRS, which is like the main body of research in France. Actually, I think it's it's among every every research lab, or almost every one of them. I'm gonna start with a short. Well, you can see I changed the title from a review on computational glacier dynamics to an introduction to computational glacier dynamics, because I, I realized that actually trying to make a review in 30 minutes or 40 minutes was maybe too much. It was very, very optimistic. So a short introduction. I, I actually was a, well, I am a former student from the Erasmus Mundus Master of Computational Mechanics. So that's in Thimne. So two years ago, I was in Barcelona doing my first year. Then I moved to Nantes for the second year, Ecole Centrale de Nantes. And in France, it's very common to do the master internship in anywhere in the country. So I found an internship in Grenoble, in IGE. It, and it was basically, it was called finite element modeling of glaciers. So I, I thought that sounded very fancy. And then I started doing my internship there last year. And I like it very much. And I have to continue there as a PhD in the same, in the same project. And in IGE, we are a, a lab of geoscience, so we actually, roughly speaking, we have like three main branches. So in the, in the end, actually, it's a mix of the lab of hydrology and oceanography with the former lab of glaciology. So they got together two or three years ago. And right now, well, we are about uh, 240 researchers, more or less, plus also services. And uh, yeah, you find here people who do a lot of modeling, about uh, climatology, meteorology, there's also uh, many labs of chemistry, etc. And I'm going to focus, of course, on the work that uh, we do on glacier dynamics. And I'm part of the Criodin, or Criodin group from Cryosphere Dynamics. And basically, we model, as you can see here, with basically glacier flow and polar ice caps. So this is everything related to climate change. And uh, we have a very strong background on numerical methods. Also, there is a lot of field work. Hopefully, actually, next week, I will be going to the glacier to do some, some work to retrieve some data that we use. And well, and that's basically what we do. And we are using, you know, for our modeling, we usually uh, use finite elements, uh, software Elmer, which is an open, uh, open software, open source software especially with what we call Elmerize, which is basically a branch of uh, ice rated functions. So Elmer is, uh, is modular, and then basically means that every partial differential equation that you consider in your system, basically you use it as a different module that affects your mesh, etc. And then that's, that's basically what we work on and the kind of uh, methods that we develop. And we are very strong in that. So in the international settings, if you look for uh, numerical methods applied to glacier dynamics, you will find many, many, many work done by people in my lab. So I'm, I'm very happy for that, actually. And well, uh, some of the key processes that we do, and I, I will give some details about that later, a glacier friction loss, which actually this is the topic of my PhD, is kind of like boundary layer theory applied to glaciers that has some, some special nuances and also ground light dynamics, which is one of the main issues that the glaciology community has right now when determining how much uh, will be the rise in sea level due to climate change. And I, I will give uh, more details uh, later in the presentation because actually that's one of the main sources of uncertainty when we try to know, okay, 
yeah, climate change is happening, sea level is rising, how much? And, and there is a lot of uncertainty here, actually. So uh, the objective is going to be maybe the, the seminar is going to be a little bit chaotic because it's uh, really, really a big field. And trying to put everything together in 30 minutes is maybe a, a really big uh, um, work for me to do. But basically, the idea that I would like to, so the point that I would like to, to point out today is uh, more or less the scheme of things. So how, how things work in, in computational glacier dynamics. And also, I would like to spur some interest so you see that there is room room for uh, a lot of work and a lot of numerical methods and it's actually something that we'll see that it's very important because we there's a lot of uncertainty there is a, a continuous lack of, of lack of data and we really need better models than those that we already have because we have too many models the results are completely different be between them so we really need to 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 know better actually and also because it's very interdisciplinar so there is I would say uh, like for every subject, <laughs> that's a, a way of, of saying that, but for every subject that I had studied during the two year long master in computational mechanics, I would say there is always an application that you find in computational glacier dynamics. So there is a lot of fluid mechanics going there, also of course solid mechanics because ice is usually modeled as a um, viscous fluid, but then when you see Calvin like icebergs, that's a brittle material, so that's a solid that is very dependent on temperature, for instance. And also, you have um, a fracture mechanics. So usually, we model it using finite element method, but also there are a lot of use for discrete element method. And of course, we are trying to solve really big problems at really large scale. So there is a lot of need for high performance computing, inversion methods in order to put together the data that we have with the results and uh, that we get from the different numerical models. And again, high performance computing, uh, large case models, so there is a need for efficient schemes, maybe some reviews of the models, I haven't seen much of them actually, so that would be really nice to to have them. And yeah, basically there is um, there is room for, I would say, everything. And that's, uh, that's something that, uh, at least for me, now that I'm starting in the field, is very, very, very interesting. So if I manage to, to make you uh, interested about the glacier dynamics, computational glacier dynamics, so I would be very happy. And that's kind of like the, the objective of the seminar. So, like, uh, why, apart from the, I would say, the intellectual interest, well, um, there's actually, so now, of course, climate change is happening, and it's something that uh, we are already sure about that. And actually, glaciers are responsible, is about the 60% of the currently observed sea level rise. And it's not only that this uh, sea level rise this is going to affect people who live in the coast or people who live in the, I mean, the, of course, if you live in the coast, you're really, uh, you're really affected by sea level rise. If you live in high mountain areas, the fact that climate change is making glaciers disappear is directly affecting your life. It's not only that you, uh, I mean, your environment change and also there is more risk for avalanche, for instance. But it's not only this 10% of population that live in the coast or 10% of population that live in the mountain. It's also that uh, it means a global shift in um, in the ecological system and also for instance if uh, ice disappears and that's something that here in france uh, in the alps we are very concerned about and in switzerland as well which is the tourism for instance so there's a lot of now studies that try to assess the impact on the ski season that the disappearance of uh, glaciers will have it also has a great impact on the availability of uh, of water resources which will impact agriculture so it's something that really uh, the, um, so the effects of glacier changes throughout the globe is something that is very, very easy to assess and there is a lot of uh, growing interest actually now because the, this, these changes are happening and they are accelerating. And that means, that's a more pragmatic point of view I would say, but that means that there is an increased interest in climate change related research which means that uh, we can see now there is more funding available and we have a lot of projects and uh, European projects and international projects that are uh, into try to have better models of better results to assess these changes. So that's also, I mean, I, I know that's not like the, you know, the, uh, what should be said, but that's right that now there is more 
public money available. So that's also interesting. I think it's a, a strong point to make of why why it's useful, I would say, to be interested in, in computational glacial dynamics, for instance. And so to give you a, um, a broad image of what is that that we do, so I will start with a very classical, oh yeah, well, yeah, the ingredients. So of course we all know fine tuning modeling, basic steps, we need geometry, we need some equations, and then we know the boundary conditions. And I will go, I will skim through, uh, through these different, uh, let's say, steps or ingredients. Especially because what I have discovered, I kind of knew that already when I was preparing the seminar, I realized that the big issue that we have in computational glacial dynamics are the boundary conditions, which is actually where most of the discussion is happening and, and, and the different sources of uncertainty come from actually understanding, applying and modeling the, the boundary conditions. And I will, yeah, as I said before, I will start with um, a really, really simple idea of what a glacier is, so we can start going through different equations, understanding what are the, the issues and why we need better modeling here. So this is like the classical abstract 2D cross-section of a mountain glacier. So for instance, this is the one that we have here close uh, in the Alps, Argentia. And basically, so glaciers are masses of ice that flow due to gravity. So we have here the, so this is the bed, so it could be usually rock if we are talking mountains, could be also some kind of sedimentary layers, for instance, some places in Greenland. And basically the ice accumulates here in the accumulation zone, which, which well, we have the snow precipitation, and then due to gravity, is uh, it flows down, and then after it passes this called equilibrium line, it starts to be in, uh, basically melted by the different ablation zone, by the different climatic conditions. Basically here we have sub-zero temperature, here we have warmer temperatures, and uh, thanks to gravity, it moves down, and that's why we have uh, ice during uh, all year round, actually. And this whole um, I idea of this basic scheme is something that is quite well understood and accepted. So this is not where the issue is. And of course, uh, that depends how you how you model uh, a glacier depends, of course, of what kind of glacier you have. So this is like very easy, uh, basic uh, shape of mountain glaciers. So they are smaller in size, that's several kilometers long, some hundreds of meters high usually, and they flow in this nice shape. But of course, if we move, for instance, to Antarctica or Greenland, we may have. Uh, different geometries. So now we have this huge glacier which has much flatter actually, they flow faster and some conditions are actually different. We are not uh, in this uh, small, relatively small geometry that is easy to understand, that is easy to study, that doesn't actually need that much uh, heavy computational resources in order to uh, be modeled. Now we are talking about uh, hundreds of kilometers and tons and gigatons of ice. So this is actually like uh, another level of modeling. And this is, if it is a land terminating ice sheet, as I say, an ice sheet is this super long, very wide, with a really small aspect ratio um, kind of glaciers. This is different, of course, if we now think about the kind of ice sheets that we have in some coast of Antarctica, which actually end up in the sea. And I, I'm making this point actually because most of the of the future uncertainties that we have regarding sea level rise is actually due to what's happening in this kind of ice sheets and ice shelf. And this is, for instance, this is an example of Pine Island Glacier, which is a, a glacier very famous uh, in Antarctica. And as you can see, for instance, this so this is an uh, the ice comes in contact with the water, this starts floating, this is called the ice shelf. And this tip of the ice shelf that we see here in my drawing that is very small, actually if we go to the example of Pine Island Glacier, this is about like 30, 40 kilometers wide, and this uh, chunk here of ice that is about to break, by the way, it's about like 15 kilometers um, long. So again, uh, we have glaciology that it's uh, very easy to understand in a small context, in a small um, background, like a mountain glacier, but then actually we're, we're, what we are trying to solve are these really big, large-scale masses of ice that are moving very fast and that could potentially actually uh, 
drive into the ocean and cause a huge increase in sea level rise. So this is where I would say most of the like the big ch game changer uh, is located actually in terms of modeling because in the end it's the same problems. We use more or less the same equations for the flow, but the outcomes and the interest and the problematics that we have and the data that we have available is actually very different. And something that we I hope that we can we can see as I present some of the issues that we find in, in modeling. Um, and yeah, so as I said, more or less the basics of how ice moves is something that it's uh, approved and more or less everybody understands. So usually in model ice, the ice, the flow of ice as a viscous fluid. And it's so viscous that actually instead of using the Navier-Stokes flow for the equation for the flow, we use the the Stokes flow equation. So okay, we get rid of the inertial tense, that's nice. But then we find that actually ice as a as a fluid is very very non-linear. So now we have um, our material that actually, due to it being non-linear, it becomes suddenly quite more uh, difficult to understand, to model, and, and and to solve. And of course, there are some more nuances here. So it's also it uh, depends on on temperature. So the viscosity of the fluid depends on the temperature. There's some anisotropy, but it's more or less well accounted for. Uh, is uh, usually if you study the subjournal, so in, we're talking about tiny steps of hours, there is also the elasticity part, so instead of a viscous flow, it's a viscoelastic, uh, sorry, instead of a viscous fluid, it's a viscoelastic fluid, but that's uh, at the big uh, picture, that is not um, the issue, and we just use this nice Stokes flow with a not so nice, very non-linear behavior. Um, by the way, I think this is this is similar to the way that we model the flow of the mantle. So of the magma. I, I don't know. I'm not sure here, uh, but I think that very very similar. And well, yeah. Uh, if we use a smaller, um, if we have a smaller domain such as mountain glacier, maybe we are using the full version of this equation with all the components. If not, we use something that is called reduced order. I don't like that. But where it's a kind of like a 2D approximation of uh, this equation, it is the famous shallow ice approximation that we use in Antarctica, etc. But in the end, basically, we have this equation, so Stokes flow with a very nonlinear fluid, and then we—that's what we are going to use in the core of our domain, and we will solve it with linear finite element methods, usually. And, and that's like the kind of shape that we have a flow is is more or less this. So this is like again a cross section of the glacier. So we have here the ice that is flowing down above my bed, and gravity is causing this uh, increment of force. And um, this is balanced at the bed by this uh, called the basal drag. And actually, this is important to see here that the, the shape of the flow that we consider when we have a glacier. So in glacier dynamics, we usually have two components of the flow. One that is constant, that is called the basal slip, which is basically the velocity at the bed, and then one that varies with depth, that is the deformation velocity. And you can see uh, that is different to usually what we consider when we have, I don't know, water in, in aerodynamics, also with air or hydrodynamics, that we have the no slip condition. No, in glaciers, we have the slip conditions, unless we have a very cold glacier so that the ice is frozen to the bed. We always have slip here. And that also, it's, uh, it's another source of, uh, that makes things more complicated, actually, when trying to model glacier dynamics. Because in the end, we have here at the bed, and I will, I will um, point that out later, a quite complex relationship between the forces, the basal drag that we have generated here that balances my gravity-driven forces, and the velocity at the bed, which uh, may be 90 or 95% of the total velocity. That's and that's actually something that we find in Antarctica. So in, in resume, we have a nice flow equation with a not very nice material, and then uh, we have a flow that we more or less understand the shape that it has. But when we try to actually uh, compute and know how it is behaving uh, in the whole domain, it's not um, it's not that easy actually. And there is a lot of a lot of work being currently done on trying to understand better with um, data, especially with models, what's happening here. And then we come to the, um, so the kind of boundary condition that actually we try to use to better understand this 
this flow that I that I showed you before. And I'm start. I'm going to start actually with the with the easiest that is not that related to glacier dynamics. So usually when we are working in in a glacier, we will try to see what's happening in the future. So for sure, for that we need climatic conditions and the different climatic forces depending on the different uh, scenarios. So if we are if we want to model the evolution of the ice caps in Antarctica, of course we will need as boundary condition how the climate is going to be because that will affect the temperature and, and ice depends on temperature and so that affects the precipitation so how much mass is coming onto my domain how much is leaving etc and thanks to SADA data we can also compute surface velocities which will be used with inversion methods to constrain my model and, and adjust the different parameters that we will have and also that allows us to compute with some error the geometry that we have in the bed so the geometry for our domain our computational domain and the ice sickness which of course the, will have an impact on the flow this for instance is the results for Antarctica that we had in 2019 from NASA and uh, if we don't have such a big domain we can always revert to the famous glaciological method for instance this um, um, mountain glacier in the Alps which basically means that in order to upgrade data we literally go to the glacier we start putting some GPS stations and we make some measurements and then uh, we have uh, we have the data that we need, and that's actually one of the one of the first issues that we find when trying to model glacier dynamic, which is that the data or most of the data that we have is located at the surface, but that we have seen the domain is not only the surface; it's of course the thickness. I mean, the whole depth of the glacier and what's happening with the flow. It's actually very important to know what's happening down, so in the in the interface with the bed. So how do we do that? How do we how do we know what's happening below? Well, uh, because it's very difficult to access the the bed. So in a classical mountain glacier, we would have maybe 200, 300 meters of ice. In Antarctica, we can go to kilometers, and is, that is basically impossible. So we do that with models, and we develop different models, and then we try these uh, different inversion methods to try to match up my models with the data that I observe. And with that, I will, I will use my climatic forcing to know what's going to happen in the future, the more or less the scheme of things. And this is actually where the uncertainty is, and this is where we have different models and when the different results will depend on these uh, models that we use. And this is why we need a lot of modeling here, because there is a continuous lack of data, uh, especially in the subsurface of the glacier. Um, and that's that's a huge source of uncertainty. Um, for instance, I don't, okay, it's a little bit cut. Well, it doesn't matter. Um, one of uh, these sources, I mean, it's as I said before, is the bed conditions, and I could spend hours here because this is the topic of my PhD. But basically, um, the objective here that we have when trying to come up with models for for the bed, for what's happening at the bed, is trying to come up with the friction law, which is basically the function that relates the velocity at the base, ub, with the basal drag or the friction that we observe at the base, which is tau p, basal drag. And typically, as I said, when you have in aero or hydrodynamics, you have your different boundary layers with the no-slip conditions, the velocity at the base is zero, and here in ice is not the same. We have this slip, and actually um, there is a huge, I mean, a whole world of models here because it's very difficult to to validate them actually. So in the end, it, we have a series of mathematical relationships, and typically they have been assuming that actually there is a complete slip. So yeah, I have the velocities are tangential to my ice bed interface, but actually this is sliding with no friction. So all the forces that I see, all this tau b that I consider that I have that balances my gravity, is actually a result of normal reactions at the different uh, roughness, so the rugosities of the bumps that we observe at the bed. This is like classical theory says that. Whereas actually we know that glaciers have um, debris, which means that, yeah, we are going to have some some tangential reactions and that's going to actually make this relationship a little bit more complicated. And it's not only that, because actually as uh, glaciers, ice, frozen water, and as they flow, they carry a whole network of um, channels 
full uh, so filled with water inside and as my glacier accelerates actually these channels um, reach the bed and they start to grow and they uh, shape they have these cavities that we call that basically are um, whole parts of the bed that are drowned by water which means that this relationship between velocity and, and drag is even more complicated because now depending on my velocity the area of contact will be different and the distribution of forces is going to be different and 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 everything is going to be much more complicated so uh, again if on top of that we have that it's very difficult to see not only not only gather some data in terms of velocities and and, and forces but it's difficult to see what's happening in the end we what we obtain is a bunch of models built on different assumptions and uh, depending on the model we use, we have completely different results. And yeah, and we have actually we don't have, I would say, an idea of, or we haven't set it out which, if there is, the best or the most correct uh, model for that. So we have uh, our domains. We have our very nice velocities that we have with the satellite data. We even have some idea of the geometry at the bed, so of this shape. But in the end, we don't really have a good link between the velocities that we have at here at the at the interface ice bed and the drag that we are supposed to to balance and actually um, so this is one of one of the um, oh, on top of that of course we don't have actually the the long time series that, that's something that we will see constantly in glacier dynamics which is that glaciers are very very slow they have inherent long um, time scales, which means that we, in order to better constrain them, we actually would need long time uh, series in, in terms of data. We don't have that. So actually, even the historical data that we have is is not the best to constrain and to to check one 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 relationship between velocity and drag uh, to check if that's that's the one that is working. And since actually this whole process is um, regulated by the geometry, there is something that happens between like tens and hundreds meters. And the geometry usually that we get with the satellite data isn't that good. It's usually over over this uh, this size, so over this uh, scale. And I put typically the, the finest, and this is extremely fine, but the finest data we have in Antarctica, for instance, is in the coast, about one kilometer. And of course, this is not enough. I mean, this is uh, already over the size in which we expect this process to happen. And uh, we, we are using some kind of uh, subsurface radar in order to infer the geometry in a mountain glacier. So in the Alps, again, we have errors about the tens of meters, which means that it's not obvious to, to use the, the data that we have for the geometry of the bed to model this interaction. So, there is really there is really an issue here with validation, and which means that in the end we have a lot of models, and we really cannot tell one from the other which is the best. And actually, similar to that, we have another boundary condition that we apply in glacier modeling. In this case, for ice caps and ice shelves, and actually for ice ice sheets and ice shelves, which is the interaction with the sea. And this is actually, I would say, one of the hottest topics right now. You see a lot of work here being done. There are many projects being done, and this, there is a lot of room for improvement because this is a very complex model. So typically, what we have when you have the ice, this is an ice sheet that we can find in Pine Island Glacier, the one that I showed before, this one. When we have this, we have the ice that is coming in contact with the, with the ocean. And then, of course, um, we first, what we have is that water is start to come in and starts to melt the ice. And then depending on the geometry of the bed, this is a prograde or a retrograde, so if it's positive or negative um, slope, we can expect the ice to be stabilized. So this the, the ice will advance to the right and will more or less be stable over the years. Or maybe there is a point in which if my ice that was initially here retracts to this, uh, so to this retrograde slope, it may start actually due to an inherent instability in the mechanics of the ice sheet to go back, 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 back. And this could potentially, some people claim, this could potentially mean a huge increase in, in the amount of ice that comes into the water. 
And there is also an idea that says that this, this is not going to happen. So it's not that we have this mechanism of how a geometry, water, and my ice flow interact, which is actually, they say, this is not the issue. The issue is, comes with ice clips. So there is a, there is a, a point, a moment in which due to the, the water, so the hydrology that starts to weaken the ice and the height of this ice sheet, that will have cliff, cliff failure, so ice will start to to break, as in yeah, having this brittle behavior, so basically producing a lot of icebergs and calving, and this will uh, cause a huge increase in the amount of ice because they will start to to break, and then as they break, our glacier let's say go back, but then we find an even taller um, cliff, and then so they start to fall, 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 fall. And actually, there is no. So these are all theories, more or less, that how it how it works. Either ice goes advances, and if we have a negative slope, suddenly we find that the, the interaction between ice and water makes the ice to to be melted and breaks. Or actually, uh, we have these huge cliffs that start to fall until I mean non-stop uh, falling, and then we have a continuous source of uh, um, of loss of ice. It's more or less what what is being theorized that is going to happen or may happen at all these tipping points in in Antarctica, but actually the and they're very important because if we see the sea level rise that it's um, expected from these two different mechanisms. So if this one this uh, ice sheet instability, so it's uh, basically the the contact point between ice and the land goes back. We expect about 0.25 meters by 2100 whereas if we have cliff failure if this mechanism which has never been observed by the way this is all theory and modeling if this is happening we could expect an increase in one order of magnitude about one meter by 2100 uh, and one meter is a lot by the way it's, it's a lot of sea level rise and and yeah so there's a lot of uncertainty here and many mod, uh, models being done some people claim that this is going to happen and we're going to have a lot of uh, marine ice sheet instability and that's going to cause the drain of antarctica in some very specific points some people claim that the ice cliff instability is not true that is not physical it hasn't been observed so yeah that's a point against that but well there is a, a ton of work here um, as I said, so the ice cliff instability is in discussion and actually this is a very, very difficult problem to model because we have this ice flow, this viscous flow, that suddenly would start to fall as a brittle material, it starts to crack, basically. So we have a lot of fracture mechanics here. And then trying to, to implement this calving into our continuous flow loss is already, is already one, one challenge. And here we have a lot of work done in, in continuum approaches that try to come up with calving rates, so a loss, uh, a loss of mass at the end of the of our glacier, or also uh, yeah, using discrete um, element methods to try to come up with the crack propagation depending on the temperature of different um, different parameters of the, of the ice. Of course, there is, this is always influenced by the temperature, the amount of water that you have, the hydrology which we don't have a lot of data about that, by the way. With the geometry of the bed, that as I said before, is not uh, the best that we have. And we don't know here. So the, the, the whole point is we don't know. And the, there is a huge potential for a sudden increase in sea level rise. And there are still many models. People are claiming that we have two mechanisms and we haven't decided if both of them are, are physically feasible. And on top of that, in terms of modeling, it's very complex. We have, we have, the, we have this uh, coupling with the ocean, and this coupling with the weather, and with the geometry, uh, the hydrology. And of course, these are all uh, a processing in which we have uh, that ice is detaching from the main ice sheets, which means that in terms of finite domain modeling, for instance, we need a lot of remeshing, and we need efficient and smart techniques, because the, the mesh is continually is continuously changing and actually because it depends on the geometry we really need a fine mesh because we need to be able to to track this evolution because actually theory says at least that they are that a small change in the slope of the bed like here it could actually mean a huge increase in the amount of ice that goes to the ocean and the amount of sea level rise that we will finally have 
So yeah, it's very complex. It's very, very difficult to assess. There are, again, as in the basal friction thing, there are a lot of models. There's not that much data. And uh, in terms of um, computational models, it's very complex and requires a, a, lot of, a lot of different things to consider. And it's very interdisciplinary, basically, because we have yeah, fracture mechanics, we have remeshing, we have coupling with the ocean, we have um, trying to come up with, uh, trying to convert these discrete methods into some kind of continuum Calvin rays that we can apply at the large uh, scale models of Antarctica. And on top of that, there is a lot of uncertainty on the different parameters that we are going to use, actually. And that's kind of like, I would say, the main points to consider when doing that. And yeah, and just like putting all together to have like an idea of uh, what are, where are we right now in, in computational glacier dynamics, I'm going to use the example of Antarctica. So just to recapitulate more or less, so we have, of course, our domain. And uh, this domain, we have surface mostly on the, sorry, data on the surface, mostly by satellite data then we build our uh, our mesh over it in the interior of course we are going to use bigger elements and we're going to solve this nice flow that we have but then the problems come when we go to the boundaries so either the external boundaries the contact with the ocean in which we will need finer meshes and we will need to use a head and we need a heavy use of remeshing techniques because of the different physical processes that are happening these physical processes that are happening at the interface are not very well known and depend on many, many complex soup uh, processes and parameters that we will try to, to fit. On top of that, we have, of course, the interaction with the ocean that also depends on, on the amount of water, sort of the amount of ice that comes and the climatic condition that we have. And if we go to the uh, basal boundary, so in the, in the contact ice bed interface, we are going to use some model of my basal drag, which again uh, is not very are not very well known yet actually and we will try to use the data that we have in order to fit all my different models and to try to come up with the behavior of our different glaciers be it a very specific glacier or be it the whole the whole uh, ice in Antarctica, for instance. And when with that, we will use our different climatic forces and we are gonna be able to uh, model the future evolution of all the, the ices that we have. And then try to come up with some idea of what's going to happen in terms of sea level rise or glacier retreat, for instance. And um, yeah, that's kind of like the situation in which uh, we are. And just a final note, a point that I made before, which is the, the issue that we have with model validation. And it's, uh, it depends on the scale, because we have, a, as I said, a really long time scales, which means that, which well, means two things. First, that we don't have these long data sets that I commented, but also that glaciers are not in equilibrium already. And, and that's, that's one issue that we also have to take into account, which is that the behavior that we are observing today is actually the result of the climatic conditions that we had 20 or 30 years in the past. And in the whole mankind disappeared today, so if we stopped producing any kind of uh, greenhouse gases uh, and, and the like, we would still see that glaciers will continue to retreat in the next 20, 30, 40 years, depending on the, on the area, which means that there are systems that at the long term, which is the, the, the long term is that in the end we are actually mostly interested uh, in there are systems that are not in equilibrium already and um, and also that we have yeah we have a lot of models probably due to the fact that we don't have uh, that the validation is very difficult and that means that the, there is room for improvement because really the the different the results so the, the if we use one model or we use another that will have a huge impact on the on the results of um, that that we are studying and that means that there is room for improvement, that we need better models, not necessarily more complex, of course, that would even, I would say, uh, increase the problematic, but just better models with uh, or at least uh, models that are the easier to solve, I would say. And now with the advent, of course, of high-performance computing, 
um, maybe in something that I don't know why I haven't seen much reviews of their modeling in in glaciology, and I'm interested. I don't I don't know why. So so that's actually something that I that I have to uh, look upon because that could I mean Antarctica in the end is always the same. So so we have some really big 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 problems that take forever to solve because you can see the many many different models being used and boundary conditions that change etc there is a huge dependence on parameters so there is really a need for more efficient solving schemes in my opinion and that's all so sorry if it was uh, maybe a little bit chaotic there is a lot to say about this and of course here at EJ actually we always have room for collaboration we have many students with the COVID of course this year we had less but uh, usually we have many master like myself like I was a master student and then many PhD and postdoc positions also and so yeah if you're interested I usually go to Barcelona quite often so if you're interested in all that uh, I don't know drop a mail or or tell tell anyone who may who might be interested that there is also space for them and yeah that's all thank you very much thank you very much uh, Pedro. Um, I think that we have time for some questions if anybody wants to start so I'm gonna what do I do okay okay well <laughs> uh, hello there's your here Hello. Thanks for the thanks for a very interesting talk. Uh, I have one question on the on the rheology that is usually uh, used for 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 glacier and ice. Yeah. What, what kind of laws and what kind of relationship uh, are the are the typical? Um. So that if I'm not mistaken, like the international name would be Glen Flow Law, I think. So basically, you have that the the ice has a, depends. I mean, the effect, effective viscosity is usually the, um, related to the deviatoric stress, and the, yeah, is usually related to the deviatoric stresses and the glen flow law exponent, which is the reason why it's. Uh, I'm gonna actually. I think I'm, I can share the screen to show you the equation. But anyway, it's glen flow law. It's um, it's one viscosity that actually is rate weakening. So the more deviatoric stresses that we have, the less viscose that our ice becomes. Glen flow low. Okay. Okay. Thank That's why. I, I will invite you back to to ask you some more more uh, concrete questions. Thank you. Okay. No, you're welcome. Thank you. Um, any other questions? I'd like to ask something from Pedro. Yeah. Um, we talked at the beginning of the presentation um, about an uh, open source uh, software, Elmer. Yeah. Can you talk a little bit about it? I mean, are you using it or have you managed to run any simulation so far? Yeah, I mean, that's, uh, well, that's the one that I use for my, so for instance, my as i said my topic is the basal friction law so boundary layer theory let's be like it's easier to understand and for instance what i do so what i do usually is not work on these big 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 models of let's say let's try to compute let's try to simulate a 3d version of a given glacier uh what i do actually is uh, i built my so my mathematical domain nice with a really nice geometry like you would do in a i would say classroom exercise and actually, it's because ice is so linear, I then build a mesh of that, and then I solve my my problem with that. So I, I use that every day, and um, it's a very, I mean, it's not as nice to use as any commercial software, of course, but it's a very. It has the advantage for us that it has been used in the what was it was one of the first softwares or uh, finite element solvers that were used in glaciology. So since two thousand and five I would say so that's 15 years and it uh, basically it has many many already well-known uh, models and equations built onto that so 
Elmer is, is a modular, so it's used for almost everything, I would say, a lot of magnetomechanics and thermomechanical coupling also. But in our case, the advantage that, that it has is that we have been using Elmer for 15 years, well, we, they, and we have a lot of work uh, done on that. It's not the only open source uh, program uh, solvers that we have for glaciology. I know that some, like the lab, the Jet Propulsion Lab in California, I don't know exactly which lab, but in California, <laughs> in some some other universities, they also they have produced already their own uh, code in C++. So Elmer is in Fortran, and they have their own in C++. And I would say those two are the main ones. I'm not very sure about that, but I would say they are the main ones that I use in terms of modeling. Okay. And, I, and I guess that this is an ongoing uh, research, but uh, do you have any preliminary results or something that uh, you can show us today? Uh, yeah, well, it's, I mean, probably would need a little bit more of background here, but the ones, because actually I'm already in preparation of the, of the, of the paper that we want to have, which is, I'm very happy about that. So for instance, in terms of, the, so my whole PhD is, is uh, on top of this Saussure project, that is the, one of the links that I had in the presentation, but you can ask for it, or you can see it in the, in the recording. And, and so the, actually the point of my project is to try to validate these friction laws that we have. Because as, as I said, we don't really have an idea of which one is the better. We have, but it's not really, it's not very well validated. And then, um, so the project is about, okay, so we have a little bit of data and also let's try to challenge the main assumption that we have for our models and see if they, if they exist, like if they, if they make sense, physically speaking. And for instance, the, one of the main assumptions that I, that I have shown is that there is this uh, sliding without friction on the interface. So we assume there are no tangential friction between the ice and the bed. That's something that was uh, proposed in the 50s. Everybody has rolled with that, although we know that's not the case. So it's like, okay, so we have these models that uh, assume there is no friction, no tangential friction between ice and, and, and the bed. But we know that's not true. Uh, so what's like, what do we do with that? And that's actually what I have done. And the result is very nice. It's not exciting, I would say. Because let's see if I can. I'm just gonna show you uh, just some some shapes, and maybe you will have to believe me. Uh, but uh, the results are not, as I said, not very exciting. But the if we put some okay different uh, parameters that I'm gonna, I'm not going to talk about that. But basically, we have the relationship between my tau b, so my friction, to the power of three. This actually three, it comes from the non-linearity of the ice. If it was linear, this three would be one. And then we have here the velocity, and again some scaling variables that we don't care. So in black is the one of the laws that we are using right now. If we don't assume friction, if we assume that we have tangential friction. Basically, some, there is some change in scaling. The shape of the law is, let's say, the same. There are some nuances here, but the shape of the law is the same. So, yeah, uh, that's like the result that is not very exciting because that means that the, the friction laws that we have been using, at least they don't, de they don't really depend on this assumption. But it's also nice to see that, okay, we are safe. So we know we are safe. That's, that's a... Uh, Okay. We are happy about that, I would say. But you see that uh, many times uh, in these uh, many models, and again, I mean, they ha we have an issue with validation, actually. And we are trying to, at least in our lab, we are trying to, at least for the friction, to have uh, it uh, better. There is also some people working on the whole Kelvin, because there is not a lot of, uh, there's m many models for Kelvin, and so the, how icebergs break and the different parameters and different processes that influence the the amount and the rate at which ice breaks and detaches. But we don't we don't have any global model, let's say. I don't know if that's possible. Because we don't have um, we don't have data. Yeah, I, I understand. So then I mean you talked about many different problems of interest in glacier dynamics. And for the moment you are like focusing on, on the glacier flow, let's say, and in the friction law, right? Yeah. Okay. Okay. So so you don't have you don't have not uh, done anything on on fracture mechanics on 
No, and um, actually here we don't do much. Uh, one of the, for instance, in my, in, in my lab, I mean now, in, in IgE, what has been done in fracture, for instance, has been actually on the Calvin rates, so on the continuum approach. So we just say, for, with some equations in the end, we come up with a relationship, and that's the amount of mass that we lose at the, at the width, um, a more, like more detailed modeling in that sense. But I know some people are actually using our same software, so something that they are doing, I think if we look for Ben, and that's the surname of the main research, B-E-N-N, -N, in the UK, they are. I think there is an Andrews, I'm not sure. Basically, they are using uh, our same software, MRIs, to simulate for several time steps how ice advances, and then they take the, the shape of the, of the ice, and then they go to a discrete element method uh, software, and they reproduce the same geometry in a discrete element way. And then there is where they use the different damage models and they compute how the uh, cracks propagate and what's the state and then how it breaks and then it goes it goes back. So it's like a like a coupling. And then they, they take that results, they go back to the flow equations, they solve the flow equation for several time steps and they that's how they, they implement, for instance, the Calvin. So you use the continuum for the continuum and then use the discrete for the discrete. That's more or less the that makes, that makes sense, I guess. Yeah. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, is there any other question? If there are no more questions, then we can uh, thanks again, Pedro Roland. Oh, thank you for and uh, thank uh, Pedro, Pedro Diaz, because uh, we met like one year ago and he said, hey, why don't you come? And then COVID happened, so we make it online. Yeah. Uh, let me just say that I have to apologize because I was in a PSD uh, committee and it took much longer than expected because uh, we got uh, some problems in Meet that uh, thankfully it didn't happen in presentation because uh, we got collapsed with uh, Oh, boom. So I know worries about that. Uh, this is the I, I also wanted to say that uh, uh, many thanks to Ignasi for the success of this shifting of the seminars and the coffees to the to the telematic mode and Pedro for proposing Juan Pedro it was very interesting. Uh, you know that we have uh, work in the uh, modeling of ice. I don't know if Nasi, if you have mentioned this to Juan Pedro. No, He's I didn't mention. I didn't but, mention. But, but I'm going to uh, if you send uh, your uh, me your email, I'll send you some recent work that we have done on the modeling of ice with the particle methods. Okay. Okay. A recent paper, a recent paper we have published on, on that topic. Okay. <laughs> okay, interesting. Okay. So, yeah. Ignacio, could you pass, pass me the email of Juan Pedro and then I yeah, will. Yeah, I, I will send it to you. I will send it to you. Uh, copy so, just for, for for everybody to know, this seminar is, is recorded and will be uploaded in the YouTube channel of Simne. So, if anybody wants to uh, watch it again or watch it later, uh, it will be available. So, if I say the line, you can go back to me and say yeah. that's not true. So the seminar will live forever. Yeah. 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 So many thanks. Okay. thanks. I mean, thank, thank you. Thank you also for the, the opportunity. It was uh, nice to come back all online, of course, given the circumstances. So I'm, I'm very happy. I'm very happy. Yeah, we too. Okay. Thank, thank you, you very bye. much. Goodbye. Everybody. Bye. Goodbye. See you in the next seminar. Bye. Okay, bye.